I want to do I I want to do uh similar to what I did on yesterday to 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 uh, allow me to share a few words and then to be able to enter into dialogue with you. Um for this morning um uh I I title uh this lecture The Power of Voices the power of voices. And let me ask that as you uh, listen to the, the few words that I will share, um, that you use this as a filter as you listen. What voices are being shared in our Black churches today? What voices are being shared in our black churches today. So believe it or not, it was in seminary that I was first introduced to African-American sociologist W.E. Du Bois. Uh, and, 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 and I wanna say this, it was the first time that I got introduced to Du Bois in seminary. Um, I did not get introduced to Du Bois in the predominantly white uh, high school that I attended in Augusta, Georgia. And interestingly enough, I didn't get introduced to Du Bois um, while I was at Tuskegee, maybe because I didn't take the right classes, maybe because uh, in, a, in another life, I received my uh, BS degree in chemical engineering. So all those technical courses that I was taking, uh, it just didn't, uh, uh, he didn't show up. Or it could be because, uh, uh, it, it's it's believed that Booker T. Washington and Du Bois didn't always get along. So maybe they just didn't talk much about Du Bois on campus. But it was in seminary that I got introduced to W.E.B. Du Bois, and in particular, got introduced to his classic work, The Souls of Black Folk. And 120 years ago, 120 years ago, in this 1903 work of W.E.B. Du Bois, Du Bois says the Negro is a seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no, self, no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to emerge his double self into a better and truer self. When I first encountered it, this 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 notion of double consciousness really resonated with me. It resonated with me because it gave me language concerning my own community. I, I realized my concern was for a community. I felt measured who it was more by the judgment of the dominant society rather than by God, their creator. And at the time, this quote gave language to my ministry. It 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 helped me to see my ministry as one that would aid the black church in understanding who it was individually and collectively in the eyes of God. I saw my ministry as one called to equip the saints for ministry, Ephesians 4.12, helping them to claim and embrace and understanding that God calls all of humanity into existence for a meaningful and necessary purpose. No one enters this existence by chance that God calls all persons into being to serve in partnership 
and covenant with God toward the continual renewal of God's creation. It's the reason why my definition of creation is, or the purpose of Christian, Christian education uh, is to set people free, free to be children of God and free to be co-creators with God. It also resonated with me when I had my first youth ministry encounter, which was also in seminary, through what was called then the Youth Theology Institute at Candler School of Theology, Emory University. That experience helped me to understand that young people also experience double consciousness. They too wrestle with that sense of always measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. And at that time, YTI was a four week residential ecumenical summer academy for rising high school seniors who came from across the country for an opportunity to seriously engage in Christian theological education. The hope was that young people attending would fall in love with theology as a lifelong pursuit in that cadres of public theologians, young people who are willing to take their faith and apply their faith to whatever their calling in life may be, would be cultivated for church and society. The young people with whom I experienced doing this program were absolutely amazing. They were, they were bright, they were articulate and, and eager to learn and to grow. They truly wanted to wrestle with issues of faith. They, they, they wanted to know if God mattered and whether they are and, and whether who they are and what they do matter to God. They were not afraid to ask the tough questions and struggle with more than one right answer. They found a place where their thoughts were taken seriously, their voices heard, and their status as emerging adults recognized. They were called scholars and were treated as such. And the first lesson I learned from these amazing young people was that they weren't looking for adults to be their peers. They yearned for loving, caring relationships with adults willing to hear them and willing to guide them. And it was at YTI, in my interaction with these young people, that I also discovered how powerful voices are. Now, when I speak about voices, I'm talking about the socializing forces of family, friends, school, and popular culture that serve as conversation partners in the lives of these young people as they wrestle to discover who they were. Many of the young people came from elite academic backgrounds, struggling under the pressures of what quote unquote right schools to apply to or what quote unquote right major or career they may uh, or they, they should pursue. YTI gave them new lenses for seeing the world. They had many opportunities to wrestle with identity and purpose theologically. And many of the young people ultimately made different choices as to what they would commit their life to because of their YTI experience. And when I think about my work at YTI and the subsequent youth ministry work I've done, I keep coming back to this notion of double consciousness, this notion of determining who I am based on what other folk think or feel about me and how powerful voices are in shaping who young people become. There's a Russian scholar by the name of uh, Mike, uh, Mikhail Bakhtin that argues that embodied in one's quote unquote voice, embodied in one's talk, embodied in one's speech, conversation, is one's perspective, conceptual horizon, intention, and worldview. Bakhtin says embodied in one's voice is their way of seeing the world, how they see others and themselves. He says that embodied in one's voice, in one's speech, is their identity or their sense of personhood. He says our voice takes shape 
out of the dialogue of voices that take place in the communities that influence us. In other words, when we speak, when we produce an utterance, at least two voices can be heard simultaneously. Bakhtin says voices never exist in isolation of other voices. We make meaning when the voice of we, the listener, responds to the voice of the speaker. Our worldview and our sense of who we are begin taking shape as we engage an inner dialogue that is in response to the outer dialogue we have. So when we engage in subsequent conversations, the statement of our previous conversation partners are omitted. They're still present visibly. Their words are not there, but traces left by their words have a determining influence on all our present and visible words. So when one attempts to aid a person grappling with the question of identity, their purpose for being, I believe it is important to know what voices have served as their conversation partners. The voice that a person interacts with may have a profound effect on their self-image or their identity. I realize I have heard a lot of voices in my life, which means that I've had a lot of conversation partners. And these conversations have taught me that our identity, our sense of meaning and meaning making, including the work of faith, form including the work of faith formation is greatly fashioned by the conversations we have with others. And these conversation partners work diligently to become the primary influencer in our lives. They are allowed to ascend to the level of primacy based on who, based on whom we choose to listen to more. And I realize I've struggled for years with, with the voices of my past and the voices of my present, with the voices of affirmation and the voices of denial and realize that my own sense of self rests in what voices I would allow to have the greatest influence. So I want you to think about it for a moment. Think about it for a moment. Whose voice do you hear when you are making critical decisions in your life? Who ends up being in the back of your mind? Whose voice did you give primacy to? as you're engaged in critical decision-making? Whose voice did you give primacy to as you have and continue to make sense, to make me, to engage in meaning-making in your own life? You see, my concern for our young people is whose voices are they allowing to have the greatest influence on their lives? as they engage in identity, faith formation, and meaning making. And my research and experience with young people convinced me that they are, that at the core of many challenges and struggles confronting them are really spiritual yearnings that need to be satisfied. And I'm convinced that young people struggle with a spiritual emptiness that they oftentimes are unable to name, yet, yet seek many ways to fill. Young people are thirsty and not always able to articulate what is at the heart of their thirst. All they know is that they're thirsty and, they're, and there are many competing voices telling them where they can go to satisfy their longing, their yearning, their thirst. So allow me to, to quickly suggest that there are at least seven spiritual yearnings young people are seeking to fulfill. Identity, intimacy, purpose, healing, mentoring, nurture, and courage. Let me name those again. Identity, 
intimacy, purpose, healing, mentoring, nurture, and courage. And allow me to, 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 to walk through very, 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 very briefly each one. I believe the spiritual yearning of identity is to, to understand who they are, to answer the question, who am I or whose am I? It's a yearning to understand what it means to be made in the image of God. Who am I in God's greatest story? And then there's a spiritual yearning of intimacy, a yearning to be loved unconditionally, unconditionally by God, church, family, and society. There's a spiritual yearning of purpose, a, a, a yearning to understand their reason for being or to be able to answer the question, why am I here? What role do I play in God's greater story what do i understand to be my own sense of call then there's a spiritual yearning of healing or yearning to be made whole again because my i would make the argument that by the time young people reach adolescence each one has experienced some level of brokenness so there's a spiritual yearning for healing to be made whole again. A spiritual yearning of mentoring. A yearning for caring leaders, spiritual director, interested enough to help them navigate the waters between adolescence and adulthood. Navigate waters that they've never had to navigate, that they have never navigated before. And the spiritual yearning of nurture, a yearning to be encouraged and empowered in the midst of their own development, particularly their own faith development. And last, lastly, a, a spiritual yearning of courage, a yearning for the strength to live boldly, fear, fearlessly, and faithfully. And I realize that many of these seven are not new concepts. Other disciplines use these terms to address the developmental needs of adolescence. Yet I see these areas as deeper spiritual concerns, needing pastoral attention in the lives of young people. They may be developmental concerns, mm. but I believe they are equally, if not more so, Hello spiritual again. yearnings, seeking fulfillment within no. the heart and spirit of young people. I also believe that the black church in its past at least took seriously the voices shaping the lives of its young people. And I believe they did so in a way that Old Testament scholar Walter, Walter Brueggemann talks about as he reflects on 2 Corinthians 18 and 19. Here is Brueggemann's synopsis of 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. Brueggemann says, talks, shares, the king of Assyria sent troops to Jerusalem and threatened King Hezekiah. Rapshika, who whom the king of Assyria sent, confronted the Israelites at the wall of the city and mocked them for putting trust in their king and their God. Hezekiah's representatives implored the Assyrians to speak to them in Aramaic, not in the language of Judah, in the hearing of the people. But the Assyrians refused, for it was in their best interest to have all the people hear and understand their challenge. Do not let Hezekiah make you rely on the Lord by saying, the Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. But the people of Judah did not answer, for their king had commanded that they put their faith in God. King Hezekiah was distraught and tore his clothes, covering himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. 
Then he sent his intermediaries and the senior priests to consult with the prophet Isaiah, who counseled them not to surrender and assured them that the Lord would be would indeed protect Jerusalem from the siege. And it happened as the prophet had claimed, and the city was spared. Now, this passage, among other interpretations, I believe, is about the power of voices and the places where conversations take place. In this passage, conversation takes place both at the wall and behind the wall. At the wall, public or societal conversation is taking place. The voice and the primary voices of the dominant culture is taking place at the wall. Brueggemann suggests that uh, the primary that the primary conversation of the dominant culture uh, uh, is 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 operative at the wall, and when this discourse is operative, the discourse of the marginalized has no privilege or advantage. But behind the wall, transforming, empowering discourse is taking place. The community behind the wall has the power to shape the conversation versus having it imposed by those on the wall. Brueggemann would, would say there is not a, that this is not a call for the church to become separatist, but it is a call for the church to provide safe space for transformation and renewal and renewal to take place using the language and the culture of the behind the wall community and not that of the dominant culture. And I want to argue we need more behind the wall conversation taking place in our community. I'm reminded of, of, of an interview done by done with Howard Thurman. And, and the interviewer asked, Dr. Thurman, I know that your grandmother was a slave. What do you feel were the most significant things you learned from her? And this is what Thurman answered. Thurman said, she would talk about the times when a slave preacher was permitted to hold services for the slaves of her masters uh, and all the neighboring plantations. He said, I don't remember how often this happened, but that it happened at all was tremendously important. And then my sister and I would be even be, be every still because we knew what she was going to tell us. And it was this. She said, it didn't matter what the text was the minister always ended up at the same place. Then she would say, he would stand up, start very quietly, and then look around to all of us in the room. And then he would say, you are not slaves. You are not niggers, you are God's children. And you know, when my grandmother said that, she would unconsciously straighten up head high, chest out, and a faraway look would come on her face. Thurman said, now that transmitted an idiom to me. And there was nothing that could happen in my environment that could ever touch this. It gave me my identity. So I didn't have to wait for the revolution. I have never been in search of identity. And I think the explanation is that everything I've ever felt and worked on and believed and believed in was found in a kind, in a kind of private, almost unconscious autonomy that did not seek vindication in my environment because it was already in me. This is, Thurman says, this is what I tried to pass on to my children. We have to have some way to keep from internalizing 
our environment's negative judgments about us. As long as I keep the environment external to me, it cannot control me. But when I internalize it, I become captured by it. Beloved, the church must become once more, once again, must offer again its youth and others a behind the wall community that offers alternative dialogue for those yearning for a healthy and liberating sense of self. It is only when we proper that when proper nurturing and guidance has, guidance has taken place behind the wall that we can be or that we can have effective conversation and critical dialogue with the dominant society safely at the wall. Remember Thurman's word, words, as long as I keep the environment external to me, it cannot control me. But when I internalize it, I become captured by it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Blunt, for um, such a profound and moving um, lecture this morning. It felt much more like a conversation than a lecture for us, so we're grateful to you for that. Um, at this point in time, um, I wanna return to the question that uh, Dr. Blunt opened us with, what voices are being shared in black churches today? Um, and I want to just open the conversation uh, this morning with that question. Um, and for if you are in attendance, um, for you to, to share that either via the chat, but we really invite you to, to unmute yourself and to share your voice um, with us this morning. So that, que that opening question for our conversation is what voices are being shared in our black churches today? So let's begin with this question and then we will um, we'll continue with our conversation this morning. Good morning. Just to relate this directly back to youth, I think um, there's a lot of silence. There are no voices, unfortunately. Um, I think this ties really well with last night's discussion around discipleship and the lack thereof when it comes to young people today. And so I would love to hear your thoughts on what happened. How do we get to this point where the voices are either silent or they're not the voices of empowerment or positivity that we used to have within the Black church. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's complex, I think. Um, I don't think that it's, it's, it's one thing. Um, and at the, at the, and, and I don't want to, to generalize too much because I know that it's happening in some places. Um, but that said, um, I just wonder um, if, if um, in many of our Black churches, we find folks who um trying to find right words. <laughs> um, who've lost the sense of urgency. Um who've grown comfortable with the culture, um, who maybe have um, uh, come to believe that the hard fought work um, of our forefathers and foremothers have already been won, only to discover white supremacy still reigns. And now I think we find ourselves having to 
reclaim those past voices. My fear is, was there a generation or two that got lost in not hearing those voices and are not equipped to deal with the challenges that have resurrected itself again? I agree with what you're saying, and I know that on uh, last just last week, um, our conference, Christian Education and Late um, Council, sponsored um, a youth panel, and um, and and I've been listening to the youth for quite some time. But when you say behind the wall conversation, it brought me back to. Um, as my thinking about what we experienced last Saturday was that our youth, our children need safe places because they spend so much time trying to um, adapt to the culture outside of the church. And unfortunately, the church is a, is um, the opposite of what Thurman said. The church is now ad ad adopting the culture away from the church instead of having an impact um, on the on, on our surroundings, and so we have lost that those voices because as I was growing up, and I'm in my seventies now, it's that the church was the central place in the black community, but we're losing that. I I I I I truly believe you you are correct. Um, uh, it is truly diminishing more and more. I did see Doctor Love's question um, about uh, recommendations for how do we reactivate a ministry uh, uh, to the younger generation, um, because again, many uh, of those um, ministries have become. Uh, uh, inactive. And so this is where um, I can, if I could bring in a little bit from, from my comp of our conversation on yesterday. Um, part of, um, I believe our call is to become um, community uh, engaged once again. Um, the, the truth is for many of our churches, we don't have youth who are active in the church, but it doesn't mean that we don't have youth outside our church. There's a whole opportunity for developing uh, ministry with young people right outside our doors. They don't have to necessarily be quote unquote members um, for us to engage in ministry with young people. Uh, or anybody for that matter. <laughs> and so what are the needs of the young people in the communities where we find ourselves planted? What are the needs of the young people in the communities that, that our local churches find themselves? And how then can the, 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 the body of believers, the congregation come together to work with and minister to and minister for and minister along um, young people who are in the community. Um, I'll be going down a whole nother rabbit hole if I start here, but um, uh, this whole notion of membership um, deters us from doing true discipleship. And we gotta be, get beyond, I believe, this whole notion of membership has its privileges and only doing whatever work we do in our local context for quote unquote, the members. True discipleship is meeting human need. And I know that gets me in a lot of trouble, but I like getting into good trouble. We 
want to continue to invite your questions. Um, so please feel free to voice them here by unmuting yourself um, or drop them in the chat um, as we proceed. We have one, uh, one comment and question. Moral and identity formation is work that takes a long time. More time than we have on a Sunday morning, especially if we can no longer assume regular weekly attendance. What guidance do you have for both how Sunday morning can start this process and what other opportunities need to be explored? What a great question. Um, it is a great question. And, and, and I think we can start with asking ourselves, why does everything need to be relegated to Sunday morning? What other opportunities are offered to us Monday through Saturday? Um, wherever possible, ministry ought to be a seven day a week work. Because again, it's about how are we engaging with people, um, and 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 the person who asked the question is absolutely correct. You know, this 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 is not a a a once a week, uh, one workshop, um, uh, one 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 stab at at uh, at the effort uh, kind of work. This is a long time investment. But this again speaks to some of our conversation on yesterday do we really believe relationship is important do we believe that relationship building is 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 vital um and again i would want to argue that um as as followers of the way of jesus jesus starts with relationship not engaged in transactional uh uh, engagement, but really about transform transformational uh, effort and transformational relationship is about being consistent. Uh, it's about uh, 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 creating a level of tenaciousness in in our in our work with one another. It's about cultivation. It's about truly hearing the needs and 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 working with one another to address those and so i think another way of 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 approaching that question are we willing to make the investment are we willing to put put in the time for that 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 uh, for for the kind of change and the kind of healing and the kind of work that needs to be done that can that we realize can only be done over a period of time. I want to read a follow up comment from Reverend Kim Troy Richardson um, that you might uh, wish to comment on. The church must stop believing that we know best what youth and adolescents need and invite youth and adolescent into conversations and allow this demographic to tell us what their deepest needs and concerns are. Then empower youth and adolescents to lead the process of transformation. Dr. Mott, would you have any comment or further um, additions to this? I do. Reverend Kim must be and must have been in my introduction to youth ministry class that I am teaching this semester. And one of the things that I, I share is oftentimes when we talk about gener uh, generations, we tend to only think about it from um, particular kinds of demographics, uh, you know, the particular years that 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 uh, frame boomers and and Gen Xers and millennials and Gen Zs, um, and so we 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 primarily focus on the demographic dynamics of generations. And what I offer to my class is to consider um, viewing generations as its own culture. Every generation has been shaped by voices have been shaped uh, by a particular culture 
of time and space that sh that uh, frame worldview, frame how they see the world. And it is difficult, if not impossible, for boomers to fully understand um, what it means to be a Gen Xer or a millennial or a Gen Z, because even though they lived in that in 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 those years of these of these newer generations emerging they were not shaped by those years and so and vice versa gen z will have a hard time fully understanding what it means to be a boomer because they did not grow up they were not shaped by the time and space um uh that had that shaped um, many that that shape the lives of boomers. So what does that then mean? That means that if we're going to have an appreciation of each generation, that we need to have, we need to allow that generation to be our cultural tour guide through what's going on uh, and what's happening in that generation. If we want to better understand young, the younger generation, we need to allow the younger generation to tell us about their world. We need to allow the younger generation to be our guides, um, um, to, to teach us and to show us their world. And yes, walk alongside them um, as they are still navigating this emerging world from them. I still believe that we need one another. There's a little bit of wisdom that older folk do have <laughs> that can be shared. If we're if we're willing to do so, not in a way where we're trying to trying to make the younger generation um, uh, many us's, but allowing them to be who they are in the context that has shaped them. And just pass and being able to pass on wisdom without judgment as we as they're navigating new waters. So, yes, I, I agree with Reverend Kim wholeheartedly. We need to walk alongside. Dr. Love asks a really a related question then. So, how do we promote more intergenerational engagement? I believe we we have to create, you know, when we talk about the behind the wall um, work, I think part of that behind the wall work is convening of conversation. How do it's it's where 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 are we intentional about our 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 older generations being in dialogue with the younger generation and facilitating it in such a way where each generation listens to one another, not uh, try to dictate the other, not shutting out one another, but listening to the stories. I don't think we do storytelling enough. <laughs> you know, I, I think young people would benefit from hearing the stories of our older members, of our of our older generations. But our older generation would truly benefit from hearing the stories of our young uh, of our younger generations as well. And what they deal with on a day-to-day -day life that if if we're really honest and frank, some of us who are older, we don't even see. We don't even know about because we look through different lenses at the world, at our age. So what would it mean to create an intentional space behind the wall where we're able to engage in storytelling and to really hear one another? I wanna follow that up with a question from Bonnie Tomlin that I think is important and I'm gonna nuance a little bit. She says there are almost no young people in our church now. Um, and I think 
her comment relates to the context primarily of black churches today. A large um, part of the problem is that our church was once located in an all black community, um, but is now a primarily Hispanic neighborhood. So what suggestions might you have to address this? Um, it's not that as Bonnie says, we don't want to reach out to the Hispanic community, but um, we would love youth of all ethnicities, but it is a change dynamic. I And I personally want to add on to that. I lived in a context of Atlanta where there were four or five historic Black churches um, in the neighborhood that had uh, rapidly gentrified. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking about Bonnie's question as I've seen it and I'm curious your, your response. So... Uh, so and 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 you will hear me uh, talk about this um, a lot, and and again, that is the need to um, not to need not to continue to be siloed, or the and or the need to feel like we have to do all the work ourselves. So what would it mean if a community has uh, increased in um, uh, his uh, increase to have more Hispanic residents, but we are still, but the church has been a historically black church, been a major part of that community as, and, 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 and also though recognize that um if we're following in the ways of Jesus, we're called to be available to whoever is our neighbor. What does it mean then to identify other partners in the community who have a good understanding of our new neighbors and we be able to partner together um, in, uh, in ministry together with our new neighbors? Um, we don't have to feel like it, it has to happen um, totally or the onus needs to happen uh, only, uh, only with us. We can partner with other people if our goal is to um, find ways to meet various spiritual and other needs of, the, of those who now make up our community. Let's find partners to work together, who can help us, uh, who can teach us and help us better understand uh, and know our new neighbors and where we can begin to think about what we have to offer, what our partners have to offer so that we can combine our resources together to be able to meet needs. I hope that begins to answer that. Thank you. Um, Fred Kennedy Kilderman dropped into the chat um, a comment that if we don't share the stories, our history vanishes, to your point on the stories. Um, and Cynthia Cobb asked this question, and we have time probably for one, maybe two more, probably one more question after this. So if you've got a question you're just holding on to, please uh, drop in the chat. But Cynthia asked, youth need to feel that they have a safe space to share the truth of their concerns to leaders. So as leaders, what layers do we need to peel back from ourselves to listen and learn from youth without judgment? Another excellent question. Um, And one of the things that I, I do in my classes, and in particular, my youth, my youth ministry class, is go through a variety of, of exercises of self-awareness um, to help, because I believe in, 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 I believe Parker Palmer, when Parker Palmer says, we teach who we are. And if we're not, fully aware of our own, uh, the things that have shaped us, then how we teach, how we interact will still show up. And so um, how have we been shaped in such a way that moves us toward being uh, prejudicial or judging in our responses? 
um, do we, can we truly release that part of us in such a way that we can listen more versus feeling the need to impart, quote unquote, our own wisdom and knowledge <laughs> before we even began listening? Um, it requires self-awareness and it requires um, really uh, strengthening our active listening skills um, to be able to uh, hear and learn from our youth without judgment and also be able to release um, our belief. Forgive me when I say this, that we know everything. There's so much more that we can learn and so much more that our young people can teach us if we give ourselves permission to do so. We have one final question coming in. Thank you so much um, for that. We Reverend Kim Trey Richardson asked, and we recently brought in the high school football team for lunch and Q&A when we were able to listen. Our aim was to let them know we embrace youth and provide a platform for them to lift their voices and know it will be taken seriously. We have a lot of quantitative data, but rarely use it to engage in social analysis of the data, seeking to understand the why and begin to implement ministry to address the why behind the numbers. Hmm. Could you speak to her observation and the, um, the point about the the disconnect between quantitative data and uh, ministry that I think she's raising. Um, if 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 uh, Reverend Kim could come on for for a moment and just say a little bit more around um, her hopes around the quantitative data. Thank you, Doctor Blunt. Um, what I see, we have a lot of uh, tools that we use to uh, mine data, and we know uh, the numbers. We can tell you how many youth don't do this and how many youth does this, but we we rarely um, dig deeper to look for patterns and trends and themes uh, behind those numbers to help us um, along with uh, our, our youth to guide and direct ministry uh, that we can over time then begin to see a, re, a resurgence in intergenerational uh, ministry and, and, and worship. We know how many youth don't come to church. We know what youth drop out at what age, and and we know the crime rate that youth. For. We, we 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 have all this data, but we rarely, as the church. Uh, dig behind those numbers and, and 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 talk and speak and engage and have dialogue with youth and adolescents to say, how did you feel? What were you thinking? How? Why? What were the um, variables uh, that got us to uh, these numbers that we look at? And, and and then began to really have a sense of where ministry. Uh, should be going within your particular unique context. And so this is where I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna uh show my hand and um and and show my bias. Uh qualitative data is great. But qualitative uh approaches in this con in this context will serve you better. When, where are you taking, where, where are the opportunities to really hear the voices behind the data? Where are you provide, where are the opportunities to engage in some level of ethnographic research connection to hear the voices of the young people um, in your context to be able to share with you their why and allowing that then to guide 
ministry forward with them and not just to them, if that makes any sense. Uh, you will get more answers in the qualitative work, the listening to the voices, I believe, to help God. And allow and allow the 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 quantitative work to undergird any kind of resources that you want to try to get out there to help support that work and some other things. But the real um, data is in the story. Is in the voices. Thank you, sir. And, and that was that that was exactly my point. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Dr. Blunt, I think um, this this question and conversation has brought us full circle um, and wonderfully so this morning. We are so grateful um, for your joining us um, last night um, and today. Um, and, and really to offer two pieces of um, an interrelated conversation. I think we can put both what you spoke on last night with discipleship um, and the conversation um, with how you are calling us um, to attend to voices, particularly um, among Black youth today um, in our midst. So we thank you for um, your time, for your sharing of um, your spirit and um, opening this conversation um, in our midst today. Um, as we close, I, I want to invite, is there anyone uh, from faculty or members of staff who, who need to say anything, share anything uh, about upcoming events or want to offer a closing word before we sign off? Now would be the moment. President Lattimore, Mr. Everett, anything we no words are necessary, but the space is offered. <laughs> okay. Well, friends, thank you for gathering. Oh, I see Dr. Ladmore unmuted himself. Yes. No. I only did it because I assume the dean is going to reemphasize a memo that he sent out to say to the students and the faculty and the staff that reading week is is beginning. Uh, on the 14th, again, I'm, 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 I'm not sure, but it, reading week is a time for uh, pause and taking a breath and uh, replenishing your thinking um, for the students. No assignments uh, should be given by faculty during the reading week. And it's a time to uh, do some self-care uh, attend to families that you've neglected and other kinds of things, but not academic work. Anyway, that the dean may correct me. So uh, that's what I just wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lattimore. Reading week will begin tomorrow and will continue through Saturday, October 14th. And then after that, back to the books. So <laughs> enjoy students. Uh, we hope you have a restful week. Uh, as always, we we deeply appreciate you. Uh, you're the reason that all of us are here. And so we, we put this reading week in for you because we know you're dealing with a lot of things all at once, and we hope it relieves some of the pressure. So um, thank you. And Dr. Blount, just again, wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, if we could just all unmute, if, it's, if you're in a place where it's appropriate, and just if we could express our appreciation with the a round of applause for you. That'd be, I'd like that. Great job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Check in the mail and we, Thank and you, you can count on. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that, for that reminder about Reading Week, uh, for the applause. And Dr. Blunt, thank you again for your wisdom and generosity with that wisdom in our midst. Thank you all. This has been great. This really has been great. And thank you again for the opportunity and the invitation. Thanks, my friend, and welcome home. <laughs> Friends, we'll see you again. Go in peace.